the sustainability management master's program, you're answering one simple question. Do you care about your future generation? You know, if you care about your kids, their kids, their grandkids, then you care about sustainability. And a sustainability manager is someone who has the tools to make people understand how they can contribute towards developing a sustainable world. We have both part-time and full-time students. Our curriculum is 30 hours. Instead of thesis, we have a research project course and a seminar course which provides them with the kind of research background they will need to be successful in their job. But at the same time, sustainability is not always everything about environment. It also relates to the business. They will take a sustainable business strategies course. They will take a project management course. Most of these courses are going to be taught by industry people, the people who are doing sustainability on a daily basis as a part of their job. Any organization that has a large number of employees and has a physical infrastructure, they will have to have a sustainability office. If you have the passion to develop and maintain a sustainable world, come to us and we will help you shape your passion into a career which will create an impact. And uh, everyone, uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, uh, introduce our speaker today, uh, Francis Levy. Like many of you, most likely recognize her because you have been, some of you who have been here like a uh, year before last or even last year, you know, you have seen her. So Fanny is one of our own. She uh, graduated uh, from our program with a MS in uh, sustainability management just last year, uh, 2022. So uh, she got uh, her BS in uh, chemistry from Stockton University prior to at Stevens. Uh, Fran is now a senior sustainability analyst at Third Partners, a sustainability consulting firm in New York City. Uh, she was hired uh, as a sustainability analyst right out of the graduate program. And you have already achieved senior status in just one year, huh? Proud yeah, it's you. been very exciting. Thank you. She works directly with companies to tackle uh, climate change at the source. Uh, so Fran did a master's thesis uh, with me where she researched a green plant-based model to remove lead from contaminated soils in a community garden in Jersey City. Uh, and as an undergraduate student at Stockton, she studied ocean acidification within the Malika River. So Fran is uh, also a fellow of the New Jersey chapter of uh, the Nature Conservancy. So uh, today she will talk about her experience uh, transitioning from a sustainability student to a sustainability analyst. Welcome back, friend. Thank you, thank you. All right. So yeah, um, today is going to be a very casual uh, presentation. Um, again, if you have any questions while I am speaking, feel free to raise your hand. Um, this is completely your platform as well as mine. Um, the whole entire point of this is to kind of give you a look into what it's like when you graduate and get into your professional field. Um, and hopefully I can, you know, give you some tools, tips and tricks, um, and just set, set up some expectations uh, for you folks with this discussion today. So, just one second, friend. Like, yeah, like again, let me, yeah, let me reiterate because again, the, typically we hold questions, uh, you know, until the end, oh, as you gotcha. But again, this time, like again, uh, as Fran said, this is more conversational. So again, go ahead and raise your electronic hand, like uh, or your physical hand, if you are in the classroom, and then uh, we'll stop, and then Fran can answer your questions. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Yeah, of course. All right. So itinerary and Dibs got the first point covered. My background. Um, it's also in the flyer. Um, I'll also give you an introduction into sustainability consulting, um, what it typically entails. Then I will offer you some of the key takeaways that I gathered from the SM program that have helped me a lot while being a, an ESG professional. And then I will give you guys the key like conceptual lessons that I learned as a sustainability analyst and kind of like finish everything up with some tools for success that I use frequently in my job or that people in my peer set often use. Um, while working within sustainability. So this section, Dibs has it covered very, very well here um, with my education as well as my research and my fellowship with the Conservancy. So we're good to go there. 
this um, horizontal timeline or linear timeline of my experiences will be more relevant in a different section. But the only thing not mentioned on my background is that um, at some point while at Stevens in 2021, I was hired as an intern by Empower Group, uh, an en engineering firm, sorry, located in Manhattan. And I was hired as an energy engineering and auditing intern. And again, this will be useful later, but we don't have to go through it again. So um, let's get into like the meat and potatoes of this and talk about an introduction to sustainability consulting. Um, and I'll be doing that by telling you guys a little bit about my uh, firm. I promise it's more than just like a self insert. This will be useful to the presentation. Um, but basically my company is a boutique management consultancy called Third Partners. Uh, we work alongside leaders across all sectors um, and with businesses of all sizes, whether like public or private to basically, as we call it, like create value from ESG and sustainability. We are a very small firm. We are a mighty team of five people. So we have two principals and client directors, um, Adam and John. They founded the company back in 2013. I joined last January, um, first as an independent contractor and then later as an analyst. And then our most recent ESG strategist joined uh, earlier this year. And we currently have one graduate intern. Her name is Zephy and she is from the SUMA program over at Columbia University. So these are our services um, at Third Partners. For a, an ESG or sustainability management consultancy, these services are pretty much par for the course across different firms. Um, where the differentiation comes, though, is in typically uh, the personalities you come across and the quality of care you receive from your firm. So from my perspective, no consultancy for that reason is alike. And one of the benefits of being a smaller firm is, and this is really based on feedback we received and not just like my own personal opinion, um, we are really able to form stronger connections with our clients than some of the larger firms. And this is really for a few reasons. Um, first, the way we design our contracts with our clients they're usually pretty firm, but not restrictive. We bundle in a lot of time to be able to help our clients with like one-off unique projects that come out of urgency um, that don't necessarily get covered by any particular deliverable. And we can help them address these issues typically in the form of like a meeting, a memo or a presentation. So we're super flexible with um, the projects that we can cover while under a scope of work. Um, next is that we all have the ability to wear different hats. So as a smaller company, um, even though I'm a senior analyst, I also am a project manager for one of our clients. And I also help provide strategy for um, other clients um, as well. So, you know, I'm taking on more roles and responsibilities that go beyond the title of an analyst, but I'm also still being compensated fairly for that work as well. So um, again, no one at this company is like restricted to their job title. Um, and finally, and you'll see that this trend is growing more common with smaller firms in this industry, but we actually have a 32 hour work week. So at any given point in time, we typically have like 10 or so work streams um, for different clients. And you might think that, you know, five people, 10 work streams, 32 hours would really stretch us thin each day, but um, we're, we're managing really well. And I feel like this work-life balance has allowed us to create such a I guess a compassionate and like understanding company culture that um, so much so that the quality of life is like reflected in our company morale and our interactions with our clients. So some weeks can be super intense, but we never attend client meetings drained, defeated, or uninspired. So again, the differentiation between your management consultancy and another really comes down to um, the people that represent your company and the values and how it's reflected in the services that you provide. So what does a sustainability consultant do? So um, when you graduate and you wanna be a sustainability professional, there are like four common routes that you can take. Um, that typically includes consulting. You can also just be a reporting specialist. You could typically do in-house work with a company. If you don't want to, um, you know, research broad industries, you maybe you just want to work for fashion. Maybe you just want to work for like uh, a motor company. You get to choose to be an in-house expert if you'd like. You could also just stick to policy and compliance. It's really dealer's choice. But um, as you can see in this, um, you know, format here, I kind of have 
everything bundled under consulting. Um, in reality, like all of these different fields overlap with each other significantly, but I feel that um, especially for being a sustainability consultant, uh, reporting in-house and policy and compliance um, is very relevant in your day-to-day -day as a consultant. You by no means need to be an expert in any of these categories, but you really should say, for example, like understand the frameworks and the standards required within an ESG CSR ABC uh, report that comes out every year. You should remain up to date with all of the applicable laws and regulations that affect sustainability um, that also impact your clients' industries so that you can properly guide them on upcoming changes in regulation. And you should also expect to kind of take the place of a company's in-house expert. Um, realistically, for a client, it might be more resource efficient for them to acquire the expertise of multiple professionals by hiring a management consultancy instead of putting the money towards um, onboarding a full-time employee. And to give you guys some more specifics about like what I do in my day-to-day -day as an ESG or sustainability analyst slash consultant, I have like two case studies here. And these are like the projects that I'm most often working on. So the first is a multinational media company. Just, you know, imagine any sort of like popular cartoon character here that you'd like. Um, this client has a mature ESG and sustainability program. Um, they own multiple intellectual properties for popular children's TV shows. Um, many consumer brands want to develop licensed products under one specific cartoon character. So they want to see this cartoon character on their pillows, their toys, their like soccer balls, whatever. And the client wants to adopt more ESG and sustainability related principles in the partnerships they form with these consumer products brands. So they want to make sure that these brand partners are mission aligned, like not using toxic chemicals, not using wasteful plastics. Um, they have good communications around sustainability and they're not making false claims. So we're helping them um, under, say, branding. That's like the service we're providing them. More specifically, product footprint and impact campaigns. So we help this client develop criteria for brand partners to meet. Again, like, do they have unnecessary plastic? Um, are they making false claims? Are they greenwashing? We then review incoming requests from potential partners and we assess their alignment given the information they've provided us as well as what we can find on their public communications and through things like news articles. And then I'll take my findings and I will submit them to the client and advise them on next steps. Is this company a good fit? Yes, you should follow through with like a conversation on that. Um, are there questions we need to ask to provide us more uh, clarity on something that we're not sure about? If so, what are those questions? And do we think it's a bad fit? Yes, there are too many greenwashing risks. Um, if you were to form a former partnership, just know that you should follow these steps to help them make a more mature program and a more mission aligned product down the line. The second case study, and this is more of what I do um, for a lot of our new and incoming clients. Um, in this case, it, it was a professional services firm. Um, this client also provides management consulting services to their own customers, but they wanted to adopt an external ESG and sustainability service. Um, and before they did that, they wanted to make like a robust internal program so that they could walk the walk before they talk the talk because it's difficult to consult a client on ESG and sustainability, but when they ask you if you have your own program, you're like, uh, no, sorry. So um, they wanted our help to basically first um, review peer communications and common rater and ranker frameworks to figure out which ESG issues are of the most important to the professional services industry, as well as the client in particular. Um, then we interview internal and external stakeholders to identify where gaps and opportunities exist for each of those important ESG issues. And from there, we develop strategic recommendations across all of those issues. And we typically include that within a roadmap and an action plan. And the action plan is the place where we outline things like who is accountable for this, who is uh, responsible, what are the quarter by quarter steps that the company needs to take for this to effectively work out, um, what potential communications can come from each of these initiatives, 
that follow from our recommended actions. For example, if they want to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion in their company, could they make a post about this on LinkedIn? Could they send out an internal email? How would they communicate this in like a company newsletter or like at the company town hall? And also, what are some really strong key performance indicators for each recommendation? If they want to help diversify their workforce, like what type of demographics do they wanna measure and monitor so that when they put out their first ESG report, they can say, hey, we have X percentage of racial and ethnically diverse um, workers. We have X percent of female leadership on our board of directors, things like that. So um, that's kind of what I do uh, day in and day out. And so I wanna talk a little bit about like my key takeaways from the sustainability management program and how they have supported me on those day-to-day -day tasks. Um, before we move on, does anyone have any questions on the last section? Apparently not. That's totally fine. You guys have however many more minutes longer to think <laughs> up some. Okay, so I told you this time I would come back and it's not for me to like brag about myself or whatever. I promise you this serves like functional purpose. Um, and that is that networking is invaluable. I cannot say this enough. I cannot underline this enough, like put asterisks all over it, like whatever, um, interpretive dance. So Stevens has a lot of like really prestigious programs at this school, but if there is anything this institution is known for, it is its ability to network and to get you a job, hopefully within six months post-graduation when those loans start to kick in. So, um, I want to show you how that has like played out in real life because it's kind of insane when you put it on paper. And although my networking opportunities have started before Stevens, like it still stands. Networking is like everything. So before I even did a master's program, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And I had like a basic interest in sustainability, but I didn't even know it existed as a degree program. So I spoke with a friend of mine who happened to be a student at Stevens. He is an environmental engineer. He took a class under Dibs and he was so, I guess, moved by Dibs as a person and as a professor that when I shared my interests and my desire to join a master's program, this guy said, hey, I'm gonna talk to Dibs for you. I'm gonna recommend you to him. I'm gonna arrange a meeting between you and Dibs. And that just like domino affected the rest of my life to my present state. Um, and so like, although my own individual experiences and like accolades speak for themselves, like I still wouldn't have had this opportunity unless I had that connection. Um, when I was hired by Empower Group in 2021, um, a former or rather an alumni of our program works at the company and uh, there were internships opening up. So she reached out to Dibs to tell him, hey, circulate this job description to your students and have them call me if they needed an internship. And Dibs did just that. He sent out the email. I responded to her. I called her. Uh, she liked me a lot. So then we set up an interview and I got hired. Again, wouldn't have happened if it weren't for that connection. Um, I was hired by my current company in 2022. So you guys have uh, sustainability assessment tools as a course right now. That course used to be Innovation for Sustainable Business. And that course was run by my boss. He was an adjunct professor. And I asked way too many questions while I was in that man's class. But he liked what I asked, I guess. And he uh, appreciated the things I had to say. So when I was finishing up my degree, he said, hey, do you want to help me and be an independent contractor for a little bit? Do some consulting on the side. And eventually when I graduated, he allowed me to have a full-time position at his company. So like that man was like a professor first and then became my employer afterwards. So very insane, just like stream of events. Um, my fellowship for the New Jersey Nature Conservancy, um, they wanted to diversify the board of trustees for every chapter across the country. Um, they wanted to introduce younger and more diverse thought leadership from people of like different genders, different races, different cultural backgrounds. And so they reached out to different academic institutions that had environmental or sustainability related programs and said, hey, like, do you have any students to recommend? And for New Jersey, they reached out to Dibs 
And at the time, the man was like my boss, my advisor, my mentor, and like my professor. So he's like, yeah, like take this one. And he asked me if I wanted to take the opportunity and I accepted. So again, that connection is everything. Like maybe from this diagram, you might read that like dibs is like the end all be all of connections, but um, I, I probably, I mean, connect with them, but uh, this is like consistent regardless of the degree program that you're in. There are influential people at like every step that you can connect with. Um, and my um, alumni- yeah, just, just to add sorry. to that, you know, yeah. like uh, as you know, like uh, that's my mantra for the program, networking. I'm glad yeah. that you're talking about networking. I always talk to our students about like the value that networking brings. It's not always about what you know. It's all, I'll take it back. It's always about what you know, but who you know matters a whole lot, particularly in a new and niche field mm -hmm. like sustainability. Yeah, it's it's quite, I, I didn't believe it at first, to be quite frank. And then like when I took stock of every part of my life that it's influenced and how it's impacted, my other friends who are currently applying for jobs, like it's it's quite relevant. Um, my alumni status at Stevens still continues to be an asset with my job at my company. Um, we were hired exclusively by one of our clients because of the fact that um, our connection point was an alumni of this program as well. He told his leaders, hey, hire this consultancy because the boss used to be my former professor and they have um, Stephen students and like I trust their capabilities. So it's been invaluable to us for getting client work and for also helping our clients who like might be construction firms that are submitting proposals to do work at Stevens. Um, it continues to be a very strong resource. So um, before I get off like the networking high horse, I do recommend like meet with Dibs, um, get to know him, listen to the emails when he's sending them out about job opportunities or whatever other resource this program is throwing at you at the time. Speak with your professors. Like, yes, they are your educators, but they are industry professionals first and foremost. They have come here to lend their expertise um, and, and their knowledge to this program. And they might have connections with different companies, um, different you know, business leaders that could be valuable to you or just help you get your feet on the ground and give you just some knowledge. I would also say reach out to seminar speakers and panel experts. Um, you are not annoying them. And if you are, that's what they're there for. And they know that that's what's going to happen after a lot of these sessions. Um, exhaust every possible channel you can. Um, consider joining a research lab or undergoing a thesis. It's a good opportunity to get academic credit and also help get some of your tuition paid for. Um, especially because like, obviously Stevens is not necessarily the cheapest school out there. And if you're living up by the school, then your rent's a little higher than most. So take any opportunity you can to get credit, get paid, and also pad your resume with some really awesome experience within a really good lab. Um, I would also say take advantage of the mentorship program. Um, it could really help you develop and take your resume to the next level and just help you become an industry professional before you even leave school. And uh, very importantly, apply for summer and winter internships. Um, internships are such a crucial portion of your resume. Even if you're part of a research lab, you need to have professional job experience um, in some capacity before you leave this institution. Well, you don't need to, but it is, is very powerful um, and good to differentiate you when you're applying for the same job as 50, 100. Like I, we, we're a small firm of five people. When we put out our internship listing, I think we got like over a thousand respondents. So again, like that's how many people you might be up against. And so you need to have a really good resume um, with as much experience as possible. Um, and I'll also remind you all that like, if you do want to go into consulting, sustainability assessment tools is probably the most relevant course for you at this time. Um, you have probably already seen the course catalog, but it will help you understand uh, ESG and sustainability frameworks and rating systems. Um, you will learn how to develop a high level greenhouse gas inventory and set goals and targets within a climate action plan. You will also learn how to measure product circularity and the built environment improvements and also become familiar with um, common sustainability communication tactics and how to avoid pitfalls. Um, this is like literally stuff that we do every single day. We are building um, greenhouse gas inventories for two clients at this point in time to help them reduce scope one, two and three emissions. 
We're also setting up climate action plans for them so that they can figure out strategic ways to approach that that don't hurt their pockets as much. Um, we are also trying to help um, companies with circularity, how to reduce end of life impacts of their products, whether it be their plastic packaging or the raw materials that are going into their products. Um, and we are advising clients on uh, sustainability communications. Again, um, what is scientifically found or sound and what is accurate, but at the same time presents no greenwashing risks and isn't like pandering to any particular audience. So very relevant course, take some good notes while you're in it. Um, and I said this in the, the flyer, but you know, I really see that the uh, sustainability management program is like a North Star. It will guide you to your desired destination, but once you're there, it is like really up to you to plant your feet and adapt to your surroundings. And so um, the various different things I learned and pulled from this program that have helped me in the four different areas of like being a professional in sustainability um, are here on this slide. So for consulting, I think that this course or this program gave me really strong research skills because when you are presenting your insights to a client, all of your data needs to be from a reputable resource and need to be, um, needs to be from representative data. Um, you can't be like sending them a Daily Mail article that says like ESG is a hack fraud and then tell them that they should cut their program. It has to be from someplace that's like valid and accredited. Um, it also gives you tools for benchmarking and materiality. Um, and I'll go more into like the tools and resources that I'm using often, but like I'm constantly using the PEST analysis and the SWOT analysis personally. Um, and if you aren't familiar with those acronyms quite yet, don't worry, like we'll talk about that near the end of the presentation. Reporting, again, it like familiarizes you with the most common report types that you'll come across. So ESG, CSR, impact reports, they all mean the same thing. It'll also familiarize you with like more financial reporting, like an annual report, things like that. Um, the common reporting frameworks, so SASB, GRI, CDP. I am so sorry, most of our work is like alphabet soup. <laughs> um, and you kind of have to unlearn that when you're speaking to some clients. So again, if you haven't learned these through your current course load, you will. Um, and for reporting, you also get the tools to measure, monitor, and disclose uh, metrics. So like key performance indicators. Are your goals smart? Um, and I already forget what smart goals mean. It's like measurable, actionable, relevant, and time bound. But for the life of me, I can't remember what smart is, uh, the S in smart. But uh, in terms of in-house consulting, so what are like really strong project management tools? You'll have to use Gantt charts all the time to create timelines for your projects. You will need RACI matrices to like determine who is in charge of what on a project. So like who's responsible, who's accountable, uh, who is consulted and who is informed. And pro four models come in um, pretty often when you are trying to budget for different ESG initiatives, like what kind of cap capital or um, operational expenditures can this company afford when they want to undergo um, this specific project? Brand. Yeah. Brand. In SMART, like S stands for specific. Thank you so much. I was like, this is going to haunt me for the rest of the presentation <laughs> if I can't remember this. Yeah, knowing you, I knew that it would. <laughs> and um, in terms of like in-house product lifecycle impact tools when you're an in-house consultant are going to be super common because you're often just trying to help them address like their operational sustainability and how to reduce, um, you know, like their products footprint. Uh, I kind of alluded it to, uh, to it before, but packaging is a really big um, area that companies are trying to, to figure out um, as well as say like transportation costs. So you should be familiar with life cycle assessments, how to read them, the standards that go into them, um, and also how to map a supply chain and how to identify risks within that supply chain. And also you learn consumer data skills. So um, I'm not sure if Rosita Nunez still teaches statistical methods, but that can help you if you're someone, thumbs up, cool. That could help you if you're someone who actually needs to like quantitatively predict consumer trends based on um, current data models that exist. Um, I'm not doing this, but it could be relevant for you. Um, so if you're someone who is more on like the computer science end and you have like a, a financial background, you could be doing more of this modeling um, in your career. And then policy and compliance. 
um, what are the current major laws and regulations that are important to your industry and your client industry. So uh, in this program, we learned a lot about CERCLA and RECRA. Uh, that's really important for people who are doing environmental work, uh, working along like environmental firms. Um, if you are trying to help companies reduce their carbon emissions in uh, New York City, this program should also teach you about things like Local Law 97. Um, and the UFLPA wasn't in full force during my time at Stevens, but I believe this probably comes up in your degree program right now, but most supply chains need to be in compliance with the Agor Force Labor Protection Act. So this is something that you should understand the ins and outs of because compliance with this can be quite difficult. And it's been um, a, a major, um, I guess, thorn for a lot of companies to incorporate and, and to maintain compliance with. And in general for policy and compliance, how can you, you know, project, you know, what regulatory uh, changes will affect my industry and how will current ESG trends influence future regulations? Um, we often see that the European Union gets ahead of us on a lot of major environmental laws and regulations. Um, and oftentimes those do have impacts on local supply chains and operations in our country. And we can expect that within 10 or so years, they might become law in the United States as well. We can try to um, predict that impact ahead of time and also buffer our clients um, to prepare for the uh, impacts that they have while they're in another continent. Um, because again, it does have an impact here, whether or not it is our law. Um, quite yet. So all that's kind of a mouthful. Um, and there's like a lot of different acronyms and like resources lifted off, list, uh, listed off. So I want to transition into lessons that I learned as a sustainability analyst. And this stuff is more like conceptual. This is like the part where I get on like a soapbox and I preach to you for like a hot minute. Um, so when you are, when you get into the professional world, um, one of the biggest things that I had to learn is like, be confident, but not egotistical. Um, we are all here for the right reasons. And, you know, this program typically has um, very prestigious students, very high performing students, um, but you still have so much to learn. Uh, I cannot stress enough that the bulk of your learning occurs as a professional. Um, and the SM program really is just there to provide you with the tools and resources to understand the foundation of your career and to perform new tasks and learn new concepts with proficiency. So I know a lot of people wanna be saviors and you are able to make a tangible impact um, through this career path. But while you're starting off, you know, you have to kind of just understand and stick to your role. Um, expect and accept feedback and criticism. It will be um, it will be prominent, but it will all be constructive and it'll all help you turn into um, just wonderful professionals in um, your career. Um, also trust that your managers and leaders will provide you with opportunities to own projects and flex your creative muscle. Um, again, they're there to support you and build you up. They understand uh, even more so that if you are an analyst with their company, they might not be, where you work for the rest of your life. And so um, they still want you to be a, a strong, well-geared professional, whether or not you stay with them after you know, two or three years. Um, feel free to propose new ideas, processes, and strategies, um, but don't take it personally when they don't pan out. Um, and I would just say, you know, remember that the lessons you learn at Stevens are like based on theoretical scenarios or case studies. So sometimes the solutions that we develop in class may not be practical for our businesses or our clients. Uh, the client is always right. <laughs> um, when I was working in retail and I quit for the last time ever, I told myself I would never believe in that mantra ever again. But um, it's still prominent even as a sustainability specialist, the client is always right. Um, our skills and our expertise allow us to develop multiple creative, innovative solutions to address clients' issues. Um, and a consultant could spend hours, days, and weeks developing a robust strategy, and the client can reject it in like the snap of a finger. So don't take this as an opportunity to um, challenge the client. They know their business better than we do. There's a reason to every decision that they make. So what's important is that we redirect ASAP so that we can maintain our deadlines, our monthly projections, et cetera. And also it's not the end of the world, it's par for the course. Um, there's a lot of interplay 
that happens uh, when it comes to business decisions. And although we don't see it now, again, there is a reason for everything. And so it helps us to be able to anticipate um, these, these changes and these decisions in the future um, and maybe prepare in advance ahead of time so that we can account for it if it happens. Um, I don't know if this is the same for most of you folks, but for me, I think S and G off, uh, issues often take priority over E more than I thought they would. Um, at any given point in time, a client could be dealing with like dozens of organizational challenges. So like low capital expenditures or operational expenditure budgets, they could have high attrition rate, um, you know, high turnover, poor employee engagement. They could be dealing with like water risk at their operational facilities or really high energy use, maybe even like safety violations. Um, and although climate change is important, uh, environmental sustainability may not always be a uh, priority for clients facing really um, impactful social and governance issues that have a stronger, more immediate effect on their bottom line and on their budget. Um, because some of those efforts can take years to address, whereas a company might be able to do more quality of life improvements to retain employees at a higher rate right now. So this sometimes tends to be especially true for clients located in states where there are less environmental regulations. But say if your client is in you know, California or New York City, they might have more of a fire under their butt to be in compliance with some of the local laws about emissions or say like environmental management. Brad, uh, Phil, has a, Phil wants to say something. Yeah. Phil, go ahead. You are muted. Phil, you are muted. Yeah, there good afternoon. Go. Thanks Thanks for the opportunity to speak to the group. Uh, just a background quickly on the graduated from Stevens uh, last century, uh, okay. bachelor's in chemical engineering, master's science in uh, technology management, uh, 40 years in pharmaceutical, 15 years in environmental and health and safety consulting. Uh, presently retired out here in the West Coast in the Seattle area. So, uh, but I've been uh, following the uh, sustainability management program since uh, years ago when you had to call in and get a seat because there was only so many <laughs> seats and only so much pizza was on order and all that. So it was uh, <laughs> very, very early days, Dan, to remember that. So, yeah. Uh, I guess uh, an important question to me for the sustainability management uh, I guess, you know, career path is uh, the opportunities that are available for, let's call it certification as a sustainability professional. And the reason I'm asking is because one of the most valuable things that got late in career was certification as a certified hazardous material manager. And it's a fairly high level uh, certification for somebody who's going to be doing uh, environmental health and safety consulting, which is what mm -hmm. my second career was uh, after after uh, being finishing up with pharmaceutical so uh, that's one i want to mention because it's uh it it doesn't it usually can't happen very early on in a career one needs substantial you know experience uh to to go towards uh, a certification it covers all the type topics you were just talking about and, and your broad level of knowledge in them and uh, mm -hmm. i'm not Again, again, I'm not familiar with the certification organizations for sustainability, but it's certainly something that I think should be uh, followed. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. There are a couple. Like uh, one of the ones uh, is uh, the ACA, the Sustainability Excellence Associate. Uh, uh, originally, it used to be SA, Sustainability Associate uh, mm -hmm. Certification, and that's offered by ISSP, which is mm -hmm. basically... Uh, you know, like uh, uh, one of the first like international organizations uh, yeah. that, that actually started this. Uh, it's right. called, uh, I think, I International S Society for Sustainability Professionals. So it's right. International Society for Sustainability Professionals. They started it as a SA, like Sustainability Associate, which is pretty much like mm -hmm. the EIT right. that you have for engineers right. and then uh, after that you get like uh, sp that sustainability professional which is uh, kind of like the pe for engineers right. so that is that is one of the certificates like uh, that are uh, available right. Uh, right now and i actually like strongly encourage our students to do that and I, like in fact the students who are in the program they get a free membership 
to I double uh, SP. Uh, Fran, if you remember it, right. like, and then as a part of that package comes like yeah. you know a study guide for sustainability yeah. associate. Whatever they learn in the yeah. program, they can actually like you know like uh, they will yeah. have no problem passing that exam. So that's one. Right. And then there is uh, you know the envision sustainability professional, but that's more geared towards like you know like sustainable infrastructure. And then you have lead, you know that obviously like of course, yeah. Many many of our sustainability right. students. Right. So right. there are quite a bunch of them. And as part of the program, they also like actually like take a course in project management. So you can take like, mm -hmm. you know, you can sort like get certified uh, project manager, like uh, yeah, PMP, right? Yeah. PMPs, mm -hmm. PMPs after yeah. you take that course. So yes, like absolutely, Phil, this right. is a very important right. point. And uh, yeah. ultimately, you know, the field is going to be like engineers. When you practice sustainability, you have right. to have show them some credentials other than just your degree you know yeah all right and one thing i found was the uh the blueprint as as we had for uh our certification gave you an extremely good uh not only a study guide towards which you had to learn in, in let's say book knowledge but also uh -huh. the types of uh things you could learn in the field while you're practicing as, as you know an entry more entry level professional so and being able to to take notes and uh, observations while you're in the field working alongside uh, using the blueprint alongside is what you mentioned they do have have that to the profession other ones uh it's invaluable because you can't go back sometimes and, and relearn that and, and remember it so it's a, hopefully yeah something so to hopefully. Take, take, a, take along take the notes and you know uh, while you're doing it because it's uh you know 10 years out when you know you're you're well along your career that's going to be the time with all, all your background and the knowledge you have and, and the experience you've done that's when you you push towards that that certification and, and that gives you a, a big next step up uh the important what i liked about it was that i once i was certified i even though my field is primarily chemical engineering and uh, management of chemicals i was certified for doing everything environmental uh, safety health uh, because i had the certification uh, at least in my certification the premise was that you were certified in that field and if you didn't need if you didn't know what you needed to know to service a client it meant you could learn it yes. so you would learn the details and then be able to serve the client at, at essentially you know the full rate that it was it's worth paying for us absolutely, so, absolutely. again th thanks for the opportunity and the type of thing you know thank you for just bringing this just, thing up just, yeah just out of school and, and just you know in, a couple of years in is the right time to really start accumulating note, the information notes about that so again thanks very thanks, much sir. we're here we're here hello hey Hello, friend. It was. It is a uh, very good. Uh, it is very exciting to hear your uh, journey from students to uh, as a senior analyst. Uh, you said earlier that uh, there are some uh, issues which uh, looks uh, easier to solve in uh, theory, but uh, in real world we face may, uh, many issues which can't be solved uh, uh, that way. Do you have uh, experienced this type of issues in uh, your uh, consultancy? Um, yeah, so um, one of our clients has like really high energy use at a lot of their facilities, and they're using like an excessive amount of natural gas as well. So um, their utilities are costing them millions of dollars every year, and they're trying to figure out ways to um, reduce those expenses. And while we're in like the sustainability management master's program, I think it was perspectives in environmental um, management. Uh, where we learned a little bit more about some of like the sustainable technologies and green technologies for generating energy and like reducing our carbon footprint. Sometimes those practices aren't um, practical for a client that wants to redu uh, reduce their footprint um, and also like reduce some of those operational expenses. So sometimes um, wind powered energy might not be accessible to them. Sometimes on site solar might not be accessible to them either. Um, it's possible for you to obtain solar power through your grid by doing that through like your service provider. Um, but sometimes clients might need to just reduce their energy use and their natural gas usage by like changing their mechanical equipment indoors, changing their lighting. Um, they might not always be able to use green power to get there. So um, depending on where you are regionally, 
Like if you're in Arizona, that's prime time for solar. If you're in, you know, a more gridlocked area, maybe in like the Northeast, you might not have access to solar panels. So um, a lot of geographical boundaries and just uh, limitations locally can impact how you would approach um, an energy efficiency improvement project at your company, for example. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. All right. Um, oh, do you have another hand? Yes. Yeah. I I'll be my new, go ahead. Hello? I think he's having technical difficulties. Hey, Abhimanyu, are you still there? You're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Can you, can you hear me now? Oh, I'm sorry. I was talking to Abhimanyu. Sorry, Dibs. Um, you can also type out your question in chat if you'd like. Right. Uh, Fran, you, you, you go ahead. Sure. Um, we'll wait for the question. Um, in the meantime, uh, we have found that ESG boosts uh, employee engagement. And this is not just like a, an anecdotal finding. This is like through um, studies and reports um, done by verifi verifiable resources. Um, companies that include their employees within ESG considerations have higher engagement rates, higher satisfaction rates, and higher retention rates. Um, so if a client wants to improve company culture, you can really gather valuable insight from its employees. So I feel like um, this creates opportunities to interview or survey employees. Um, we also use this as an opportunity to recommend that clients develop these things called working groups. So um, it's basically just an internal way for them to take uh, mission aligned employees and bring them together to solve some of the company's most difficult ESG related challenges because their internal knowledge of the company mixed with their professional expertise really gives them a nuanced perspective into what a good and reasonable solution for their company might look like. We've personally helped companies recommend, or sorry, develop um, working groups for issues like diversity, equity, and inclusion, culture, safety, and impact, uh, community engagement, and technology, safety, and innovation, for example. And I think this is my last slide on like my soapbox here, but uh, whether or not you see it, you make an impact. So when you develop your strategic recommendations um, to address your clients' ESG issues, you could really be improving quality of life for their employees, their suppliers, and your suppliers' employees, customers, business partners, communities, and ecosystems. Um, sometimes, you know, you work with a company, you develop an action plan and a roadmap, and then if they don't re renew their scope over the next like year, um, then you know, they're probably taking the time to implement your recommendations, but you're not seeing it in real time because you no longer are working alongside them, right? But, um, you know, rest assured that those recommended actions do make an impact. They are being implemented um, and you could be helping any number of people within their internal and external stakeholders um, and make a difference. So tools for success. Um, again, these are things that I encounter in my everyday or that I'm using often across all of our services. So common analyses that I'm using like during benchmarking or when I make materiality assessments, um, the pest analysis um, comes up so very often, political, economic, and social and technological factors related to um, our clients' industries are always important when we're trying to figure out what ESG issues are important to them and also what they can do and how to avoid common threats and pitfalls. The managing complex change model is also super important to figure out what resources and components a, client's, uh, a client has as part of their ESG and sustainability program. And if we can figure out what they're missing, then we can help fill that gap and address the you know, frustration, the resistance, the anxiety, or the confusion that they might be facing. We also use the SWOT analysis all the time as well. Again, taking um, into account their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats whenever we make any strategic recommendation, because if we're not factoring in every single bit 
of um, this type of analysis, then the recommendations we give them are not right sized and the solutions that we give them are not appropriate for their company. Common ESG and sustainability frameworks. So, you know, when I said be aware of these when you have to understand what goes into a compliant uh, ESG or sustainability report. And also when I said um, these are the raters and rankers that you need to investigate when you're trying to figure out what ESG issues are relevant to an industry you might be investigating. These are the ones that we are um, referencing the most. So S&P Global, MSCI, Refinitiv, SASB, GRI, and then for our clients that want to do more when it comes to their offices, or maybe they're working in like the construction space, we often consult, um, you know, the U.S. Green Building Council, uh, as well as the International Well Building Institute. And then I think this might be our last slide here. So common project management tools. So these are the most common ones that I've used or um, have encountered in this space so far. Um, Again, this is not this is a non exhaustive list um, and sometimes other tools might work for you better. Um, but for time and tasks, I really like to use a combination of Google Calendar and Asana. I know Smartsheet is really popular right now. I've heard a lot of really good things about it. So I'd also recommend that if you need help with like project management, just taking account of all of your tasks and your deadlines. For frameworks, um, I'm using the RACI model all the time on our projects um, because whenever we get a scope of work with a client, we need to establish what deliverables we have to give them by the end of our contract and who is taking um, what role uh, within that project. Because if not, you have a lot of people thinking that they're in charge or a lot of people thinking that they should be contributing when they don't have to. They just need to be maybe a source of information or they simply just need to be informed at the end of the day. So I think that's necessary for making sure there's not too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, SMART goals are also incredibly important. If you don't set out this criteria for your goals, again, it makes it harder for them to be realistic for your client. And you could not, if you're not setting like definitive timelines, um, as well as taking into account like the resources available to your client, then often the goals are not attainable whatsoever. Um, and there is no like, set endpoint, so it's difficult for them to accomplish them in a reasonable and desirable timeline. Um, and key performance indicators, KPIs, we already kind of like went over this, but um, really good tools to just measure the performance of a, an action to make sure that it's actually improving over time. Uh, in terms of decks and workshops, more on the creative end of things. So my company uses Google Suite uh, just so that we can share things with clients more readily. Whatever company hires you might be using Microsoft Teams um, or another platform to uh, talk amongst each other. But for decks and workshops, right, we're using a lot of like Miro. I'm not sure if you folks are familiar with that. I think it's a really good um, tool in order to um, basically plan out like, you ever see those images of someone who's like a conspiracy theorist and they have like a whiteboard with a bunch of pictures and like strings attaching different pieces? You could do that on Miro, basically. I think it's a really good way to like spitball ideas with your clients and also get your ideas on paper. Um, Canva is really good for making interactive presentations or flyers. Um, Loom is a good resource to basically make a presentation, but record yourself speaking over it in case you need to um, share a resource like that with a client or teach them about a concept they're unfamiliar with. Um, flat icon, if you've seen all these little icons I've had throughout my presentation, that is flat, uh, flat icon in full force. I think it's a good way to personalize your deck uh, for a client, um, adds a little, a little spark to whatever you're talking about. And Unsplash um, is also a resource for you to acquire um, free uh, high definition images that you can use in your deliverables, on your blogs. You don't need to credit the source. Um, and it can just make your presentation look more professional. And then um, in terms of data models, so the ones that I'm using most often, I'm constantly develop, developing KPI trackers that um, you know, pertain to each and every single one of the recommended actions we give to a client. Like for every recommended action, there is about like maybe three to four KPIs that they can measure and monitor. We also develop action plans. That is the house for the KPI tracker, for the goals, for the recommended actions, for the timeline. Um, 
it's just basically the package that everything is delivered within. Uh, pro forma models are really important budgeting tools. Again, if there is an ESG initiative that your client would like to undergo, but they're not sure what expenses are part of that, you can make a pro forma model to help them plan that from a budgetary perspective. A greenhouse gas emissions calculator or an inventory. Developing an in-house inventory is really important and it takes into account a client's uh, utility usage, its operational expenses, everything you need in order to project their scope one and scope two emissions uh, using all the data available. But you can also use um, for say scope three, an online calculator, uh, for example, there's the Qantas scope three calculator. There's also the business carbon calculator. These tools are super important to help our clients get an idea of what their scope three emissions are because they are really hard to tangibly measure. Even in an Excel spreadsheet, um, the analysis is way more robust than just what you can do um, in, in you know, Google Sheets or Excel. So those can be like a good first step for getting an idea of what your client's scope three footprint is. And then you can take next, next steps from there. Um, and last but not least, um, I haven't had to develop one of these yet, but a lot of our clients use things called skills matrices. Um, this is just basically a way to take stock of the expertise that is encompassed by um, your workforce, all of the professional experience that your employees have to offer um, and what services your uh, clients require. So it's basically a way to um, you know, say, if you are part of a professional services firm, someone has come in with an inquiry about property damage caused by raccoons. Okay, who in our roster is like a raccoon property damage expert? Oh, it's Phil. Like we can now assign him to work for that client. So skills matrices are super valuable internal tools that you'll often see your clients use. Um, so you might interact with those someday. And yeah, I think that's all. All right. So again, like uh, we have run out of time, but obviously it was a very well thought out presentation. You know, like uh, uh, you are going to meet with uh, the students